2005, has everyone learned a lesson and solved all these problems? What do you think? <laughs> Just like the previous speaker said. No, we tend to not learn. This chart says no. The last decade has seen double the number of billion dollar disasters from the previous two decades and quadruple from the one before. And these costs are adjusted for inflation. So this, is, this rise is real and it's alarming. Think about it. Who's paying for this? Is it just the disaster victims? No, we all are. And floods alone are causing lots of billion dollar disasters in almost every state. Especially though in my state and for the Texans. Woohoo, Texas! Okay, there you go. <laughs> And it turns out that about 90% of all declared disasters of every type end up including some sort of flooding. Now, what do you think about the 100-year flood zone standard for building and for elevation? Let me hear you. Will you decide? Bon temps, couillon. Yeah, building elevation standards and the requirement for flood insurance are based upon what's called the 100-year flood risk zone. And I hate that term because it sounds like a low risk, but it's really just the opposite. What that really means is a 1% probability of flooding above that level in any one year, not forever. And what that mathematically translates to is a 100% chance of flooding for a quality home that lasts 100 years. That is a huge risk level. And it's seven times less protective than the wind codes that are in the IRC. But it's based on an insurance underwriting guideline from the flood insurance program of the past. And that's what we have used as our building standard. Plus, on top of that, it assumes that levees and pumps won't fail. Now the IRC code for building elevation is based upon those FEMA flood maps and the flood insurance BFE standards. That's building, you know, base flood elevation. Anything below the BFE must be built with flood damage resistant materials. And if there's a crawl space, it must have flood vents within a foot of grade so flood waters can flow through it and you don't, don't cause a collapse of the whole foundation during a flood. You know, they're, they're good provisions to have, but in my opinion, limiting flood resistance to below the BFE in a FEMA mapped flood zone is Kuyan. In 2016, the area of Louisiana where I live had its worst disaster in history. It was worse than Katrina in our part of the state. It was massive. We had 17 to 31 inches of rain in three days. Over 100,000 homes flooded and 70% of them were not in a designated FEMA flood map zone. Well, you know, Texas topped us again the next year with 20 to 60 inches of rain in seven days, flooding over 200,000 homes, 75% of them not in a flood zone. Okay, you getting the message? <laughs> Of course, elevation is always the most effective protection, and it provides lower flood insurance premiums, and the higher you go, the better. But that is not an option for existing homes, for most people. And it also, in new construction, poses cost, accessibility, and marketability challenges.
So what that means is using flood damage resistant materials in a washable, drainable, dryable assembly so that if it ever does flood, you don't necessarily have to fully gut, wait in line with thousands of other people for overpriced expensive materials and fly-by-night contractors and get swindled and be displaced for months or years, which is what's typical, years, if you don't have the money. Well, ASTM, um, I understand, is working on a specification for determining the flood damage resistance rating of building materials, of specific materials. But in the meantime, that old FEMA technical bulletin, too, that you can find online just by Googling that, it shows the relative flood damage resistance of types of materials, and it's still very useful. So here you can see that the flood-hardy insulations are the closed-cell foam insulations insulations, both rigid and spray applied, are considered acceptable. Solid wood lumber and exterior plywood, they will absorb, they do absorb some water, but they tend to recover quite nicely, so they are classified as acceptable. And I'm sure it's not a surprise to you that the extruded polystyrene foam board, a closed cell type foam board, and the paperless drywall with a fiberglass mat and a moisture resistant core did the best of all of them. It took in very little water, dried very quickly, and showed no damage. However, look on the, on the right side, on the other side, the OSB panel swelled and it split did not recover, and the paper face drywall that is, you know, we normally use was just mush, you know, completely ruined over time. It lost its structural integrity, and we're not even talking about mold. So substantial permanent damage. Now, which of those materials, the left or the right, are most common in residential construction? Um, the polyisocyanurate closed cell foam board, the CDX plywood, the fiber cement siding, and the treated composite siding product that we tested, they all recovered pretty well. They took in some water, but they dried and they recovered pretty well. So they were deemed, you know, acceptable or good flood hardy options as well. They were designed to integrate high energy efficiency, which is what you know, Building America was mostly about then, with a flood hardy wood frame building assembly because everything in Louisiana just about is built with wood. That's our local resource and that's what the trades know. But it was also 130 mile per hour wind resistant, termite resistant, highly moisture managed and healthy. The local charity picked the name Green Dream, which you know was not my choice, but, but shouldn't really, it, it was good after all, because shouldn't every green home be resilient to qualify as sustainable? Sustainable means it lasts, right? Well, here are some section drawings from Joe that shows the flood hardy concept. Um, it shows a flood hardy washable, drainable, dryable wood frame building system uh, built with paperless drywall and no insulation in the wall cavities. Um, just rigid on the outside and two types of raised foundations, pier and beam, you know, you see on the left and on the right, a crawl space with flood vents and the ground under uh, the house higher than the surrounding grade with an, a little ground cover on it. Um, after you flood, you just remove the moldings, the interior trim, and use the gaps purposely left behind them to wash out, sanitize, drain, and dehumidify, and then speed dry everything with dehumidifiers. Then just put it back, the same materials. Wash and wear homes. the foil face rigid foam boards under the joists taped and sealed airtight like you've always seen in Joe's books. Um, the downside, high cost. And unless the crawl space 
place is really high, like at least three or more feet above the ground. You kind of need pygmies with really good workmanship to get it right, and we found them really hard to find. The other effective option was a minimum of two inches of closed cell spray foam on the subflooring between the joists. Um, it's much easier to install in most types of crawl spaces. With that, it, it's a good idea to still have the grade under the house higher than the surrounding grade so it drains with a plastic ground cover on it. If you have a walled uh, crawl space with just vent, flood vents and so forth, we would definitely recommend and coating the joists also with the spray foam. But in our climate, if it's completely open air, anecdotally we think that you don't have to do it if money is tight and you can't afford it. But it is really important to try and get termite shields between the foundation and any wood below that insulation as well. Well, more recently, Joe um, has published another flood hardy assembly and it uses XPS foam board on the exterior in place of the wood sheathing with closed cell spray foam in the cavities, again partial fill. The cured closed cell foam becomes rigid and it actually provides similar structural racking resistance um, in place of the wood sheathing that's normally used. And then the foam board being foam, it adds some more R value to the system and increases the water damage resistance as you saw in our little demonstration. So what do you think about this system? Mata, I like it. But the really big dilemma, and this was a huge issue for a long time, is how to replace the damaged sheathing that was removed in brick veneer homes on a slab. Well, yeah, the best practice officially recommended is to move all the brick veneer and replace the sheathing with new sheathing and a WRB. But the reality, no one had the money to do that. Flood insurance didn't provide funding for that for people. No other kind of insurance did. So it's not going to happen. It can't happen. It's too expensive. So what we did is we described three alternative make-do options with considerations that we posted online so folks can then make an informed decision for themselves. I don't really label them as recommendations per se, like other things, but as reasonable solutions. From a collaboration with my team and with Joe, here they are. One method uses closed cell spray foam with the newer rain screen products normally used elsewhere, um, but put up against the brick to maintain drainage. The second method uses a closed cell spray foam against that XPS fan fold kind of, kind of material often used behind vinyl siding, and that's held in place where the sheathing was to allow drainage. And the third method used rigid XPS foam board inserts between the studs. Okay, and, and these, um, these section drawings from Joe show that with the first method, the closed cell spray foam with the rain screen method, shows how the foam fills the space between the studs and the rain screen mat, or drainage mat, plus another two inches in the stud cavity, and that provides a structural racking resistance and a nice air tight insulation and the WRB all together. It's a partial fill. You want to do no more than 60% of that stud cavity depth because that helps the drying capacity of the wood after the next flood. Joe added something else that you can see in here. He added a coating of high permeability latex paint sprayed onto the foam and onto the studs, onto the wood, for enhanced cleanability after the next flood. I think that's a good idea. 
These section drawings show the concept of the thin XPS fan fold sheets installed shingle fashion um, and held to the back of the studs with shims or you know or whatever and you know or, or the, the the mortar droppings, um, but it's held where the sheathing used to be. So. <clears throat> That provides, you know, the drainage space and a backer for the closed cell spray foam that where then you only need like the two inches in the cavity only or two to two and a half inches in the cavity only. So it uses less uh, material to do that. There are pros and cons of each of the methods. Um, so here are the main pros that you see in green and then the main cons that you see in red. And so for both of those spray foam uh, solutions, they provide a continuous WRB. So it, it even protect the studs. They, it adds structural capacity to make up for the loss of the sheathing. It provides airtight insulation at whatever R value, you know, the R13 we need for energy efficiency. And it creates a flood hardy, washable, drainable, dryable assembly. The downside is we had some permit officials that really hung up on that one inch space behind brick veneer. Um, it does hamper drying of the wood. It slows it down. And so that's why it's important to try and, and keep it off of it and only, only do 60%. And you got to be able to find, uh, you know, a well-trained professional foam applicator. So after a flood, if everybody's doing this, the more people who catch on to this, the harder that's going to be to get. And of course, it is higher cost. With the rain screen method, that one, you retain the brick ties and everything else behind the bricks, and it's faster and it's easier, but all the it uses more foam, and then the rain screen is a more expensive material, so it, it has a higher cost. The XPS sheets method requires a lot more time and labor to remove everything you need to remove behind the studs, and then you may need to retrofit. There are two types of retrofit brick ties. There are types that you can install from the interior and types you can install from the exterior you drill through and so but that's added labor and expense also but the actual materials to do it would be less expensive than the other method the XPS foam board method, it uses those rigid foam boards like you saw, cut to fit each cavity inserted to maintain a space between it and the brick to allow drainage the new foam or caulk or seal into place. And then you can add additional sections of foam board if you want to be flood hardy or some other type of insulation that's less expensive to reach the desired um, insulation level. A big plus is that it's a do-it-yourself friendly method. So people can do it themselves or volunteers could do it or general labor can do it with readily available off-the-shelf materials that are easier to find. Um, but it is quite labor intensive and very time consuming so a lot of professional contractors probably wouldn't want to do it. But if you're doing it yourself and you have volunteers, you know, time intensive labor, you know, is not, is not your issue. It does create a WRB, you know, if it's layered shingle fashion with the brick ledge flashing and it adds some insulating value, but it's not continuous. It doesn't protect the exterior side of the studs from moisture. So what you need to do is either when you cut away the sheathing, just leave the sheathing that's behind the studs to give it a little protection, but then it's, you know, whatever mush it was, or you can remove it and then maybe try and spray paint on it or something, but that's a, that's a, don, a con. That's um, that's a challenge. It also does not compensate for the loss of the structural sheathing, that structural capacity and racking resistance. So you may need to get an analysis done and determine what sort of bracing or reinforcement is needed um, in its place to make up for it.